Uh, thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 5762 in the name of Annabel Ewing on the contract third party rights Scotland bill at stage one. You can ask those members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And can I call on Annabel Ewing to speak and to move the motion, Minister, 13 minutes or thereabouts, please. To open the contract third party rights Scotland bill. The bill is the result of some solid law reform work on the part of the Scottish Law Commission and I would like to take the opportunity to thank the team at the Scottish Law Commission for their considerable hard work in producing their report and the draft bill. I would also uh, like to take this opportunity to thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their very thorough and considered deliberations on the bill. I particularly welcome their stage one report and I am pleased to note that in turn the committee welcomes this legislation and recommends that the general principles of the bill be agreed to. I am glad also that the committee recognises the support amongst stakeholders for the bill and that the changes the bill will make to the current uh, law are widely welcomed. In the report, the committee highlight a number of issues to which they have invited the Scottish Government to uh, reflect further upon. Uh, I hope the committee have had an opportunity to consider my response to the Stage 1 report, but of course I will return in more detail to these issues a bit later in my opening uh, remarks. The bill addresses some fundamental difficulties with the law as it stands and it will remove the barriers which are stopping people having confidence in the law and using the law. The ability to create third party rights is important. There are many reasons for third party rights to be created and these apply to individuals as much as to business. For example, uh, it, when booking a family holiday, it may be beneficial for family members other than the person who booked the holiday to be able to enforce the rights under the contract. But at the present time, that is an area uh, plagued with difficulty. Also, another example would be taking out life insurance, the proceeds of which are payable to another person. It would, of course, be of value to the third party beneficiary to be able to enforce terms of the insurance policy in their favour. But again, uh, in terms of where we are with the current law, uh, that also is plagued with difficulty. Uh, another example would be a company within a group taking out a, an IT contract where it wants all of the companies in the group to be covered. Again, it may be helpful if group companies who are not party to the IT contract are able to sue under the contract, for example, in relation to losses suffered as a result of any breach. But again, that is another area of economic life where we see considerable difficulties in terms of our current common law. In everyday life and in business, it can therefore be very helpful to create third party rights. They can provide important entitlements and protections for, as we have seen, not just businesses, but also importantly for individuals. For that reason, we need a legal system which is fit for purpose and which keeps up with the times. As the Faculty of Advocates representative, Dr. Ross Anderson said when he gave evidence to the committee, the bill will ensure that Scots law provides the tools that practitioners and others need. The bill is therefore intended to address a number of problems with the law as it stands. For a third party right to be in existence, the current law requires that the contracting parties intended to benefit the third party and that the right is constituted irrevocably. However, this common law doctrine is rarely used in Scotland and has been the subject of some criticism on the basis that it is inflexible, uh, there are many uncertainties around the application of the law, and that it does not meet modern standards. I note that on the issue of irrevocability, the committee welcomes its abolition and the flexibility that the new legislation provides. The law has also been criticised as being unclear, with Lord Reid of the UK Supreme Court remarking that there is a need for commercial parties to have, and I quote, clearer rules in relation to third party rights under contract. The absence of confidence in the law as it stands amongst Scots law practitioners means that English law is sometimes chosen in place of Scots law to govern transactions that are otherwise Scottish in nature. The current uncertainty over third party rights and lack of flexibility damages 
the reputation of Scots law by limiting its use. Of course, it would be possible to allow the status quo to continue and to effectively leave it to the courts to improve the law through judicial reform. However, if this approach was taken, whilst some policy objectives might be achieved by the courts under the common law, this cannot be predicted or guaranteed and would certainly take very much longer than the statutory route offered by the bill. And uh, not wishing to engage in a law lecture, I see there's some eminent jurists here before us, but uh, of course the, the leading case on irrevocably, irrevocability dates back to the 1920s. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the Tory front bench know what case I'm going to be citing, which of course is Carmichael v Carmichael's executrix, that seminal case on third party rights and irrevocability. But even assuming that a suitable case might arise, which may be doubtful if English law is being used instead uh, as a workaround, there is also no guarantee with this approach that the policy of the objectives of the bill would be realised. In addition, any court decision would only examine the relevant facts of that particular case. It would be unlikely to look at the law in the round and would therefore be unlikely to produce a comprehensive solution in the way that the bill does. This uncertainty, presiding officer, is unsatisfactory for practitioners and others who have to base advice to clients on the present law. We see, therefore, no benefits in this uh, non-statutory uh, approach. The law in Scotland on third party rights would be likely to remain out of date and inflexible and would continue to constitute an unnecessary hindrance to business and to individuals alike. So I welcome the very positive evidence that has been presented to the committee from a range of witnesses. Whilst, like the committee, we don't think the bill will result, result in transformational change overnight, we are, however, confident that placing the law of third party rights on a statutory footing will represent a significant improvement on what we have now, and that over time, and perhaps and hopefully not too long a time, we will see an increase in the use of Scots law. And by that I simply mean that where Scottish solicitors are currently turning to these alternatives, these workarounds such as uh, applying English law to the contract or that part of the contract or having recourse to collateral warranties because of a lack of confidence in our law as it stands uh, and because of the current difficulties with which the committee are familiar, there will be the welcome option of this legislation and it seems clear that there are practitioners out there keen to make use of it. More than once, I have also heard that while some may be able to adopt expensive and complicated workarounds to the law as it stands, that facility, as the Law Society of Scotland rightly pointed out in their submission ahead of this debate, that facility is not available to everyone, but everyone does deserve a legal framework that works. This bill, presiding officer, will deliver that workable framework. It is fair to say that any issues about the bill have focused on a few drafting issues, and as I mentioned, the committee invited the Scottish Government to reflect upon these. And I will now uh, turn to, to some of the, the issues. And I am very grateful indeed uh, to the committee for raising uh, uh, these uh, uh, and bringing these to my attention. Uh, one issue that the committee raised was whether the bill uh, inadvertently fails to preserve conditional undertakings which are constituted before the legislation comes into force but which third party right may in fact crystallise after the commencement of uh, the legislation. And this was a point that was noted in written evidence from Shepherd and Wedderburn. Uh, and these, concern, uh, these concerns uh, relate to section 12, which abolishes the common law rules on third party rights, otherwise known uh, as use quisitium tertio. Uh, so we have considered uh, carefully uh, the points made uh, and raised uh, both by Shepherds and Wedderburn and discussed in committee, uh, as it clearly was not our intention uh, to uh, seek to make this cut across and hinder the enforcement of, of such, uh, if you like, putative third uh, party rights. So we therefore agree that the bill should be amended to address this issue, and I will be bringing forward an amendment at stage two to do that. Similarly, we have reflected on the provision at section 10 of the bill, which relates to the renunciation of a third party right. On the view offered by Professor Vaugenauer on this section, and also the Law Society's evidence to the Scottish Government that this provision is superfluous, we have concluded that, in fact, Section 10, Subsection 1 is not needed. Section 10, Subsection 1 is simply a statement of what is already a matter of general principle, and we agree that there is no need to restate that in the Bill. 
We are also still considering whether a change should be made to the arbitration provisions at section 9 of the bill to address the concerns raised by the Faculty of Advocates. Officials have written to the faculty witnesses in this regard, Dr. Ross Anderson and David Bartos, about this matter, as I think their concerns may be down to a small misunderstanding. Officials have suggested a meeting uh, with these uh, representatives of the faculty uh, and I would wish to reassure the Chamber that if there is a better way of implementing the Scottish Law Commission's report, I would be happy to reflect further uh, on that. The Scottish Government is absolutely committed to the principle that legislation should be clear and accessible, but it also needs to be effective. On Section 1, as I've set out in my response to the Stage 1 report, the Scottish Law Commission gave careful consideration to the use of the word undertaking and concluded that it was the most suitable choice because the undertaking may be found in one or more terms of the contract, express or implied. Against the background of that careful consideration, we are not inclined to interfere lightly with the Commission's recommendation, that is number five in their uh, report, that, and I quote, the provisions in a contract which are intended to comprise the third party's rights they're under should be referred to as the undertaking. On whether this section is unclear about what the benefit is to the third party, we think the cumulative effect of sections one and two is that the undertaking in favour of the third party must be contained in the contract, it must be clear that the contracting parties intended to confer an enforceable right upon the third party thereby, although their intention need not be stated as such expressly, but can be implied from other wording in the contract and admissible surrounding circumstances, and the third party must be identified or identifiable from the contract. I think uh, from this, presiding officer, it's clear that a third party merely benefiting from a contract between others without any of the other requirements being in place is not enough to create any right in that third party and we are therefore content with the effect of section one. As I explained also in my response to the committee, the provisions at sections four to six need to be capable of dealing with a wide and sometimes complicated range of circumstances and must be fit for all purposes. We would be concerned that in paring down the provisions to make them perhaps more streamlined, we would lose that capability, which I think would be highly undesirable. But in any uh, case, I, I would flag up that there was no real consensus from witnesses about what revised drafting uh, should look like. Uh, and it would be fair to say that their views were mixed. Uh, some found the, 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 the drafting here to be quite wordy, but others were content. Uh, and they were, that this also reflected the product of some careful consideration by the Scottish Law Commission. Ultimately, everyone was, I think, of the view that the sections achieved the right result, that is, very encouraging and I think that is the most important issue. For all of these reasons it would not be our intention to amend these sections. I hope that the committee are reassured that we have thought carefully about what they said in their stage one report. It seems clear that the bill has struck the right balance by providing an effective legal framework for third party rights whilst preserving the rights of parties to decide if they want to give third party rights and how they want to give them those rights. As Karen Fountain from Brodie's put it, people will have more confidence that what they've written down will work. Presiding officer, I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the contract, Third Party Rights Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I now call on George Scott to speak on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Mr Scott, 10 minutes or thereabouts. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And as the convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, I'm delighted to speak on behalf of the Committee on the Contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill and would refer members to my register of interests. The Bill proposes changes to the law in Scotland which allows parties to a contract to create rights for third parties. The main aim of the Bill is to make the law clearer and more usable in this area. Members will be aware that this is a Scottish Law Commission Bill, and the Scottish Law Commission Bill process itself is a relatively new one, which was created in order to improve the implementation rate of Scottish Law Commission reports. This bill is now the third Scottish Law Commission Bill to be considered by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, following changes to standing orders in 2013. And these changes provide that certain bills arising from SLC reports may be referred to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee as the lead committee. This is the first such bill to be considered by the committee in session five. 
And as members will also be aware, the Scottish Law Commission's role is to make recommendations to the Scottish Government to improve, simplify and update the law of Scotland. And I would like to take this opportunity to stress on behalf of the committee that we share this ob objective of improving Scots law where we can to ensure that it remains up to date and competitive alongside other legal systems across the world. So I would like to thank the Scottish Law Commission for all the work it does in helping to achieve this objective. I would also like to thank our clerks, lawyers and officials from SPICE who supported the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in its consideration of the bill. In addition, I would like to thank everyone who provided evidence to the committee on the bill. Presiding officer, I think it would be fair to say that this bill is particularly technical in nature. Therefore, the information, expertise and elegant evidence provided both in written and oral form was greatly appreciated by the committee in aiding our understanding of this complex area of law. The committee took evidence from law bodies, academics, arbitrators, representatives from the Scottish Government and of course the Scottish Law Commission and the committee endeavoured to capture a wide range of views on the bill. So the committee heard evidence from legal practitioners representing sectors most likely to be affected by the bill, including the finance and construction industries and less obviously affected areas such as the agricultural sector. And we also considered the implications of the bill on small businesses and individuals. And by way of background, I now turn to the current law on third party rights in Scotland, which is based on common law and which has existed for centuries. And I will briefly explain what is currently required to create third party rights in Scots law. Firstly, there needs to be a contract. Secondly, this contract must identify the third party in some way and the intention of the contract to confer a right on a third party, whether by implication or derived from an express provision in the contract. Lastly, the third party right needs to be irrevocable, meaning that it needs to be clear to a third party that the contracting parties to the contract intended to give up their right to change their minds about granting a third party right. However, there are concerns about the lack of clarity, certainty and inflexibility within the current law, which has resulted in legal practitioners and their clients not using Scots law of third party rights and instead relying on English law or workarounds such as collateral warranties. Further, a key problem with the current common law and third party rights is that it has been developed on the basis of case law, but this development itself is dependent on cases being brought forward. And however, as this is an area of law where no cases have been brought forward, there is a continuing uncertainty as the, position, as the position of the law. Indeed, the current position was dramatically explained to the committee by David Christie of Robert Gordon University as a death spiral of third party rights, as the lack of clarity in the law prevents its use, which therefore leads to a lack of case law, which in turn prevents the law from being developed, meaning that this uncertainty continues. And the uncertainty which this bill seeks to remedy stems from a House of Lords judgment made in the 1920s, as the Minister has referred to, which stated that once someone had been given a third party right, it was irrevocable. In other words, it could not be taken away, cancelled or modified. So the committee heard that this judgment has created significant inflexibility in the law as a result. And as a result, legal practitioners tend to shy away from using it. More recently, favouring English law or workarounds instead. Therefore, the main proposal of this bill is to abolish the existing rule that third party rights have to be irrevocable once created, thus making it easier to create and subsequently remove third party rights in contracts. In order to help the committee understand how this bill might be used in practice, the Scottish Law Commission helpfully provided some examples in their written evidence to the committee of when the bill may be used in practice. For example, the bill will make it easier for contracting parties to create third party rights in their contract, even if a third party does not yet exist. And this is often the case in relation to companies within a group structure which have not yet been formed at the time of creation of the third party right. I now turn to the committee's key conclusions on the bill. And firstly, it's clear that there is universal support for this bill 
as moving from the current common law position to a statutory footing will provide greater clarity for users of the law, namely legal practitioners and their clients. As well as greater clarity, the bill will also provide greater flexibility for users of the law. And as I've already mentioned, currently in Scotland, third party rights have to be irrevocable to be made. The proposed legislation abolishes this rule and will make it easier to create and also subsequently remove third party rights in contracts. The committee therefore welcomes the abolition of this rule. Nonetheless, and whilst recognising that it was not appropriate for this bill, the committee encouraged the Scottish Government in its report to further reflect on the protections that are in place for smaller businesses. It's therefore pleasing to note the role highlighted in the Scottish Government's response for the Small Business Commissioner in affording these protections to such smaller businesses. The committee also recognises that protections and balances are required to protect third parties particularly as the bill will allow these rights to be changed or indeed cancelled altogether. The committee therefore welcomes the protections included with the, in the bill at sections four to six. However, I would like to highlight concerns raised by a variety of stakeholders about the clarity and usability of the provisions in, this, in, in these sections. Uh, and while the committee welcomes the protection for third parties included in the bill in these sections, the committee invited the Scottish Government to reflect on the evidence received from stakeholders, particularly the Faculty of Advocates in sections four to six. Now I note from the response to the stage one report that the Scottish Government does not intend to amend these sections and from what the Minister has just said today, I recognise that there was no unanimity on how these sections should be amended but it is perhaps a little disappointing that a revised form of words could not be found. The committee also received evidence from stakeholders highlighting the need for greater drafting clarity in sections 9, 10 and 12 of the bill. And while I do not intend to detail these drafting concerns, we welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to amend section 10 and 12 and bring forward amendments and to reflect further on the drafting of section nine. Now, while I've outlined some of the principal benefits that would be derived from the passing of this bill, the committee is also aware that it may not be widely used in the short term. Indeed, the committee heard evidence that the equivalent new legislation in England and Wales, which has been in place since 1999, is only now starting to be used. However, it is worth highlighting the Scottish context with regard to third party the, the, the Scottish context with regard to third party rights is different from that of the English one. As I have mentioned, there is already a legal tradition of third party rights in Scotland under common law that did not exist in England and Wales prior to 1999. Therefore, the proposed bill does not start from a blank sheet of paper on third party rights. On that basis, the committee recognises that there is scope for this legislation to be used more quickly than has been the case in England and Wales. There are also both technical and financial difficulties associated with the continued use of workarounds such as collateral warranties. So the committee believes that there is good reason for greater use of the proposed legislation to avoid these difficulties in future. Presiding officer, I highlighted at the start of this speech the importance of ensuring that Scots law is fit for purpose in order to remain modern and competitive alongside other legal systems across the world. Our committee is of the view that the introduction of this bill would be a useful tool for legal practitioners and their clients to have available to them when setting up third party rights and contracts. And we would encourage the Scottish Government to promote the advantages of this legislation should this bill be passed by the Scottish Parliament. The committee therefore has no hesitation in recommending to the Parliament that the general principles of the bill be agreed to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I call Murdo Fraser to speak to the Conservatives. Welcome to the Conservatives, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I should start my contribution by reminding members of the entry in my register of interest, which states that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland, although I do not hold a current practicing certificate. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, there are many challenges I have faced 
In my career as a member of this parliament, there are the complex constituency cases with which we are all so familiar, where it seems no matter what effort is put in, it's almost impossible to get a resolution that satisfies the constituent. There are the lively debates in this chamber on a variety of divisive issues where party positions have to be set out and defended. And there are the constant pressures of juggling workload with competing parliamentary constituency and family demands. Yet I can honestly say there have been few greater challenges I've faced in my parliamentary career than trying to craft a seven minute speech to open this debate out of the bill we have before us. Now, in saying this, Deputy Presiding Officer, I intend absolutely no slight on the diligent and hardworking members of this Parliament's Delegated Powers and Law Reform uh, Committee, with their able convener, my colleague John Scott, who has already opened the debate uh, for the committee. I enjoyed reading uh, the report, which was a very fair and balanced summary of the issues being faced uh, and addressed by this bill. But it's fair to say, however, that there's not a lot of uh, controversy around what is being uh, proposed in the two and a half hours that we originally had allocated to debate the topic this afternoon seemed rather over generous. And I, I, uh, I'm sure I'm not alone to be relieved that uh, that's now been reduced to two hours. So I suspect many of us will end up making very similar points in the course of the afternoon. And I'm uh, ref refreshed by the fact that I'm one of the earlier speakers in the debate. <laughs> but uh, to the bill, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, this arose from work done by the Scottish Law Commission. An excellent body, probably undervalued, whose members beaver away to address uh, important but sometimes seemingly uh, minor changes in the law. And I'd like to uh, echo the uh, remarks from the, the Minister about the importance of the Scottish Law Commission uh, and the approach that they take towards dealing uh, with legislative reform. The bill deals with third party rights, specifically allowing rights to be conferred by contracting parties upon a person who is not a party to the contract. This is what is known in Scots law as the use quaestitum tertio, if I remember the pronunciation correctly from my law lectures many years ago. It's good enough for me and I was remembering it too. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. The issue which was identified by the Law Commission was, as we've previously heard, that third party rights could only be conferred if they were deemed to be irrevocable. This created a problem for those dealing with commercial contracts. Because if a third party right was not deemed to be irrevocable, then it could not be enforceable in uh, the Scottish courts. And in practice, there were many situations where it would not suit the two contracting parties to have these uh, third party rights deemed to have been granted on an irrevocable basis. Now, there is in practice always a way around uh, these problems. And in practice, uh, Scots lawyers have uh, got around this by drafting collateral warranties, which are separate documents conveying a specific third party right standing alongside the main contract document. Uh, from my own legal experience, I can well remember uh, good practical examples of where this issue arising uh, in, in the context of construction law, where a new building might be constructed, a developer will engage a, a range of professionals, including an architect, a structural engineer, and a surveyor in relation to the construction contract. And the contract, of course, is between the developer of the building and these professionals. But it is usually the case where on completion the building will then be sold on to a third party or leased. And the new owner or the new tenant has no direct contractual relationship with the architect or the other property professionals. So if there were a fault with the building, which would lead to a claim having to be made without appropriate warranties being put in place, or this matter not being dressed in another fashion, it would not be possible for the new owner or tenant to pursue the professionals involved in the event that there was negligence on their part. Now, under existing practice, these problems were got around uh, by with the issue of collateral warranties from the professionals involved. And in a previous life, I made a reasonable living out of drafting uh, such documents and revising them, Deputy Presiding Officer. But the changes in this bill will at least require a new approach to this and may well mean uh, that such extensive warranties are no longer required in that situation. And perhaps it will make it easier for commercial and construction contracts to be entered into. Yes, of course. Minister. I'm most grateful to the members of the convention. I just thought it may be interesting to, to draw the Chamber's attention to the fact that in terms of recent reports, in fact, uh, there are now certain difficulties appearing uh, with regard to enforcement of collateral water warranties, and that is another trend to perhaps take into account in this regard. Murdo Fraser. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to the, the Minister for that, that intervention. That's a, a useful additional piece of information to bear in mind. Now, as the uh, committee's report states, 
We have known about this problem for a long time. Indeed, the issues go back to the Second World War. In England and Wales, the problem was identified as far back as 1937, but was only legislated for in 1999. The gap in Scotland is therefore uh, uh, somewhat longer in terms of getting to legislation, but the good news is that this bill has been introduced after only three years from the date on which the Law Commission issued a discussion paper. And we have therefore moved relatively quickly to resolve these issues from the point it came to the Law Commission's attention. Now, the bill has been widely welcomed by stakeholders from all sides. There are, as the committee has identified, a few minor concerns that have been raised about the drafting, which the Scottish Government has been asked to reflect upon, and I welcomed the comments from the Minister in her opening statements about how the Government intends to respond to the various points in the committee report. But overall, it is a bill which seems to have universal uh, support. The committee considered the question of how quickly the bill would be used once passed and implemented. Now, lawyers are by their nature a conservative beast. Uh, that's conservative with a small c for the purposes of the official reports, although sometimes, of course, with a large c too. Um, but it's likely that uh, working practices will take some time to adjust to the new legislation. As John Scott has just told us, in England and Wales, the 1999 Act took a long time to be used. But it should mean that there will be, in time, a new approach to the preparation of contracts and perhaps perhaps less paperwork than is previously the case. And in theory, less paperwork will mean quicker deals and lower costs to clients. Although from my days in the legal profession, I would not want to be over-optimistic with what can be achieved in that direction. Presiding officer, I think I've done my best to fill my time on the subject. It's a very worthwhile piece of legislation and the Scottish Conservatives will be happy to support it at stage one. I will now hand the challenge on to others to continue the excitement. Thank you. <laughs> you are indeed lucky to speak so early on. I'm wondering what others are going to manage to say, but I've no doubt you can imagine something up. Uh, I call Claire Baker, please, to open for Labour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And first, I'd like to associate myself with opening comments from Myrtle Fraser. Um, but I would like to start by thanking the committee for their stage one report on the contract third party rights Scotland bill. Uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee is a fairly recent creation of the Parliament and I understand this is the first piece of legislation it has considered in this session. The Committee was established in recognition of the pressures, particularly on the Justice Committee in previous sessions, and developed from the previous Subordinate Legislation Committee, the Committee has the additional role of being the lead committee for bills arising from the Scottish Law Commission reports. Um, even with the recognition that the Scottish Parliament as an institution has facilitated, facilitated a significant and necessary increase in law reform, it can still be difficult to ensure parliamentary time for law commission bills and the appointment of a dedicated committee provides greater opportunity for scrutiny and legislation. The Scottish Law Commission plays an important role in ensuring our laws are relevant, easily understood and consistent. And established over 50 years ago, its task is to recommend laws that will improve, simplify and update the law of Scotland. As the bill we are considering today illustrates, the relationships governed by laws are constantly developing and changing as society changes. And it is important that the law keeps pace with the way in which the changes to the way in which that we live, work and do business. So this process is important. If our laws are outdated or unnecessarily complex, they can lead to injustices as well as inefficiencies. Law which is in need of reform can increase inequality and limit access to justice. The law must be relevant to how people live in society, how we facilitate good business relationships and support people's personal decisions. The, law under, sorry, the bill under consideration today comes with a degree of consensus from committee members and those who gave evidence to the committee. This might suggest that law reform is easy, but I look at other recommendations previously taken forward by the Law Commission, including the abolition of feudal tenure of land and the protection of the rights and interests of adults who are incapable of managing their own affairs, demonstrates that the changes can generate a great deal of debate and discussion. Perhaps not this afternoon, however. Uh, the bill being considered today has been thoroughly discussed by the committee and I would like to take the opportunity to thank those who have provided evidence over a number of weeks. The bill has been introduced following a long-established understanding that the existing common law governing third-party rights is no longer fit for purpose 
and a growing confidence that it should be replaced with new statutory rules. A Scottish Law Commission discussion paper from 2014 identified the range of legal and practical problems arising from the current law on third party rights, primarily concerns around clarity, certainty and inflexibility within the current law. The absence of this has meant that legal practitioners and their clients typically resort to using English law or workarounds such as collateral warranties rather than using Scots law of third party rights. In evidence, it was recognised that the law does not allow the flexibility that people need in today's commercial or indeed personal legal transactions. Uh, while the bill is widely supported, there were a few issues raised for further consideration as we look towards stage two. In changing the rights of third parties by the abolition of the irrevocability rule and introducing new flexibility, the counter to that is the need for the protection of third parties given that their rights could then be changed or cancelled altogether. Some suggestions have been made to improve the drafting, which the government should reflect on. One of the more interesting comments regarding this was from Craig Connell QC, who said in evidence, when I see sections that talk about reliance and to a material extent, I wonder what that means and think to myself that we can litigate over that. So in evidence, the government were reluctant to look at redrafting. In a briefing for today's debate, the Law Society considered signposting regarding the content and effectiveness of sections 4, 5 and 6 would improve the accessibility of the legislation, a suggestion which underlines the purpose of the bill. There was also evidence of a need to redraft parts of section 9 on arbitration, where again the government appeared inflexible at the committee. I do however recognise the government's commitment to review these sections and the comments from the Minister this afternoon, so we will see what arrives at stage two. There was a discussion at the committee around arbitration as the only available dispute resolution mechanism, with the suggestion that this might not best serve all contracts, particularly construction contracts, and not provide flexibility. I note the committee and the Minister's comments that they were not persuaded of this case, but I hope there is an opportunity for further reflection. Uh, so, President Officer, the Bill aims to provide a new statutory framework with clearer, more usable rules on third party rights and provide clarity in Scots law. There is, however, right at the outset, a recognition that while the Bill seeks to address the use of workabouts or the deployment of English law, it is not expected to be, to be widely adopted any time soon. While there is undoubtedly evidence to support the need for the Bill, it is initially unlikely to be used very often with a preference for the familiar and a tendency towards caution or conservatism as described by Murdo Fraser to be anticipated from the legal profession. However, witnesses, including the Law Society and the RIAS, suggest that the benefits offered by the legislation may encourage legal practitioners and clients to use the bill, particularly those in the pursuit of flexibility, which is currently offered by English law. Others identify difficulties with the use of collateral warranties. The Faculty of Advocates make an interesting point that the accessibility and clarity of the legislation may be an advantage to people who are unable to access expensive legal advice. The Law Society briefing for today states that it is important to bear in mind that the legislation will significantly improve the position of parties who were always going to use Scots law, particularly those who cannot afford the legal advice necessary to set up an arrangement which uses foreign law of a complex alternative. Their interests should not be forgotten. So if it can increase the quality and good legal practice, that is to be welcomed. There is, however, no expectation that the bill will immediately make any difference to working practices, but it does address an identified weakness in Scots law and provides an additional tool to be used alongside other existing alternatives. There is a role for the Scottish Government and partners to highlight the potential benefits of the legislation. And although challenges have been identified, raising awareness will lead to the appropriate use of the legislation, increasing confidence and familiarity. In advance of the bill being passed, the Government could reflect on the most appropriate way to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Ms. Baker. And now the challenge for the open speakers. Uh, I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Alison Harris. Mr. McMillan. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, uh, I don't need to address all of the bill as both the Minister and, uh, and John Scott, the convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, have already undertaken that role in their usual efficient and meticulous manner. Uh, but uh, I was actually quite impressed by uh, Murdo Fraser's contribution, also Claire Baker's, in terms of their understanding 
uh, all of obviously what we have discussed has been through the evidence uh, in the committee and certainly with, uh, with Murdo Fraser's um, contribution is uh, seven minutes which he clearly felt as if he was struggling to, if he was going to manage it, uh, I actually thought that the whips will, be, will have watched and listened to Murdo Fraser uh, this afternoon and will have uh, appreciated that was Murdo Fraser's pitch to get a transfer over to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee so that, so that he can undertake uh, this particular piece of work mm -hmm. going forward and also further SLC bills as the Parliament progresses <laughs> in this session. But uh, he's not denying it, signing officer, so it must be true. So a, a couple of points that I do want to discuss, however, uh, they have been touched upon by previous speakers, but, but they are worthy of further uh, debate. But before I do actually highlight these points, I do want to address uh, one issue. And as members know that the, this bill uh, has come about because of the work of the Scottish Law Commission. And this is the third such bill, and also the first time in this session that the SLC has sent a bill to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And certainly in the last session, I was on the, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in the last session of Parliament, and we undertook a similar piece of legislation. That was the, the Legal Writings, Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Act, which was passed in 2015. And if memory serves me correctly, it was uh, the Minister's uh, brother who steered that bill uh, through the, the session at the time. But, and, and I genuinely thought at that time that, uh, that using the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee was a, a useful uh, tool to actually have in the armory of this Parliament and when it comes to law reform. And so I, I generally am delighted that the, that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee now has that power and now has that responsibility to actually look at law reform because uh, I do think it does help uh, with the, whole, the wider issue of law reform in Scotland. The DPLR committee uh, certainly has been supportive uh, of the bill uh, and those who have provided evidence uh, have certainly suggested that. And certainly paragraphs 27 to 40 uh, of our committee report uh, touch upon uh, the speed of law reform uh, and, and the introduction of this bill in particular and as others have uh, highlighted. As the evidence shows, uh, there wasn't much by way of concern uh, about this but nonetheless during questioning I did ask uh, the Minister uh, in light of the SLC proposals uh, being, uh, certainly kind of going forward, being smaller, could more, fo uh, sorry, with this particular piece of legislation, it's a, it's a smaller focused legislative improvement. Uh, and uh, I did ask him Minister, if, if she and the Scottish Government uh, would consider alongside the SLC, uh, when further SLC bills actually are introduced uh, into the Parliament, uh, could they potentially incorporate uh, more than one area of law reform? Uh, I certainly am pleased that the Minister provided uh, the commitment to actually explore this issue uh, for the future. Now, as we know that law reform uh, doesn't take place on a regular basis or in a vacuum, and as this bill uh, and the area it covers highlights, so therefore if it can be possible to improve and update the law by more SLC bills covering multiple areas, I believe that, that we can uh, truly uh, make even more headway in terms of law reform. Now, we're not alone, however, as, the, as this bill does highlight that uh, similar legislation in Westminster uh, was first uh, muted in 1937, with a bill being presented to the UK Parliament in 1999. Now, I now want to touch upon a couple of the aspects of the bill. But firstly, the bill provides the certainty uh, that that's, uh, the codification of the law of third party rights uh, provides certainty uh, for users of Scots law. Now, our report uh, highlights this in paragraphs 51 to 61. So law firms will be able to use this certainty in legislation instead of using expensive collateral warranties or using law, f uh, law from other jurisdictions. Now, Murdo Fraser touched upon the issue of the collateral warranties, and it was touched upon as we went through uh, the evidence that they, are, they can be expensive, uh, and uh, there was a, uh, a hint of uh, some uh, organisations uh, might actually prefer to still use collateral warranties because of the revenue that they can generate for those particular firms. But I think that this piece of legislation in front of us will certainly help deal with that and actually help Scots law. Uh, in our case, it certainly will, it, it will actually have that, uh, it have that issue of uh, potentially ensuring that, that uh, cases don't actually then use English law but can remain using Scots law. Witnesses were clear that uh, there won't be a rush to actually use this new legislation uh, as training certainly will be required once it's actually been enacted. But nonetheless, in time, it will be used uh, in a greater number uh, of contracts. And as such, that can only be of economic benefit for Scotland. I thought the evidence from Karen Fountain, uh, a partner with uh, Brodie's 
LLP was particularly useful uh, when she said that the bill uh, is effectively uh, taking us back to the Ron Seal moment. Uh, the contract should do what it says on the tin. At the moment, you cannot be, uh, be confident that this is the case uh, and you need to be confident. Now, uh, I, I thought that certainly was a very strong argument to actually use with this. And Jonathan Gaskell uh, of DA, DLA Piper, who provided uh, positive evidence also, and he stated, for that reason, the bill is a good thing. It codifies the existing law and gives certainty. Now, the final point I wish to touch upon concerns sections four, five, and six of the bill. The evidence we took as a committee was clear. Witnesses presented their opinions on the clarity of these sections, and the faculty of advocates uh, suggested uh, that the sections were not easy to follow, and the Law Society of Scotland actually shared this view. Now, the Law Society of Scotland uh, have also presented members with a useful brief for today, uh, once again highlighting these particular sections. They provide a suggestion uh, to assist in making these sections clearer. Now, I absolutely agree uh, with the Minister and her evidence uh, to the committee, and as we touched upon that in paragraph 90. However, our committee in paragraph 91 uh, does invite the Scottish Government to continue to reflect on the clarity and usability of the provisions. And uh, as uh, members will know, that we received the Scottish Government's response today and having read it, and I will read it again, uh, as well as uh, the members' contributions from this I, afternoon. I'm afraid, and I never thought I'd have to say this, I must ask you to conclude. Uh, I've been enjoying the bill, so okay. Uh, I, I, I noticed it's your second thank you DPLR. Very much. You're, you're a rarity. Uh, can I call Alison Harris to be followed by Ben McPherson, please? Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I very much welcome the opportunity to participate in this afternoon's debate on this bill. I also thank the Scottish Law Commission for their work, which led to the introduction of the bill and for helping us to understand the importance of reform of this area of law. I have been involved in the scrutiny of the bill as part of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and I've heard very compelling evidence, along with my fellow committee members, on why the general principles which this bill captures are the correct ones, and I will therefore be supporting it at stage one today. Let me turn firstly to the problems with the current approach at common law, which have been consistently identified. We heard from the Scots Law Commission that the common law was not fit for purpose and that waiting for the courts to change it could take decades. Lord Reid of the UK Supreme Court said that there was a need for clearer rules in relation to third party rights under contract. Indeed, the current law has remained unchanged since 1920, but in our modern market economy, the requirement for reform is more pressing, and that is why it is up to us in this Parliament to embark on reform. One of the main challenges which the current law presents is that it has contributed to significant legal uncertainty. The Law Society of Scotland has said that lawyers are really not comfortable with giving advice to clients in areas such as this where the law is unclear. For example, it is not even clear at present what remedies are available to third parties in the event that their rights are breached. The Scots Law Commission highlighted the issue as one of the main benefits of codifying the law, calling it the most significant uncertainty in the current Scots law of third party rights. The requirement for third party rights to be irrevocable is another serious issue with the existing legal position. This essentially means that for a third party right to even be created, the parties must intend to give up the right to change their minds about granting the right at any point in the future. In the committee, we heard a lot of evidence which echoed the concerns of the Scots Law Commission, who suggested that parties were deterred from creating third party rights at all because of this requirement, and lawyers are left looking for workarounds, such as using English law instead. This happens because the legislation in England, the English Contract, the Rights of Third Parties Act 1999, grants much greater flexibility to the contracting parties. It allows them to terminate or vary the terms of the contract without consent of a third party. This kind of approach actually encourages the party to create parties to create third party rights in a way in which the Scots law deters them from doing. Bringing the law in Scotland onto a statutory footing is beneficial. But as the committee heard from Hugh Dundas, the Honorary Vice President of the Scottish Arbitration Centre, the bill is also beneficial as it brings some harmonisation between Scots and English law. He said, and I would agree that, it would be unfortunate if we tripped up on a difference in principle between English and Scottish legislation, given that there is such a high volume of common trade. 
The main principle which this bill takes forward is the abolition of the existing rule that third party rights have to be irrevocable to be created. Contracting parties are severely restricted because they cannot build flexibility into a contract at the outset or respond to events as they unfold in a flexible way. This bill can also bring greater clarity to third parties about how they can enforce their rights in a way which they cannot do so currently. It is essential that when the Scots Law Commission and practitioners tell us that the common law is creating commercial barriers, that we respond accordingly and pass legislation to remove those barriers. The Stage 1 report of the committee highlighted the fact that the general principles of the bill had very broad support, but identified a few areas where it could be strengthened. While the evidence which we heard suggested the bill may not be widely used in the short term, I do hope that the greater flexibility which it allows will encourage parties to make use of it in the future. I also welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to reflect on the Committee's comments about the drafting of some of the provisions, and I hope that those concerns will be addressed as the Bill proceeds. As we work to overcome these challenges, the general principles of the Bill remain the correct ones, in my view. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, this bill gives us the opportunity to bring not only greater clarity to the law, but to create a framework which allows third party rights to become usable. Third party rights which are properly created and able to be revoked in certain circumstances will be positive for the parties to the contract as well as for the third parties themselves. By building greater flexibility into our system of the third party rights in Scotland, we can offer the commercial environment which contracting parties and third parties need. I sincerely hope that the Bill can achieve its objective and addresses the concerns which have been identified in the current law. And can I thank everyone for listening as if they hadn't heard all of this earlier on in the day. Thank you. <laughs> You're a wee hero. Uh, can I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Monica Lennon, please. Mr McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I refer members to my register of interest, my voluntary register of interest as a non-practicing member of the Law Society and also to my employment history as a solicitor with Brodie's LLP, uh, some of the experiences of which I will refer to in context of, of this debate. I'd also like to thank the Scottish Law Commission for uh, the pr process in which it uh, took them to this point where we are, are debating this bill at, at stage one and also to, to fellow members in the chamber today and, and on the committee and the witnesses for, for their evidence and, and for the, the, the arguments and speeches put forward today. I welcome this bill, I strongly welcome this bill and the, the principles within it as a development to make sure that Scots law is fit for purpose for modern commercial environment, is flexible and ready and can also provide, crucially, contract security. The codification of third-party rights will be helpful for practitioners and their clients, as Myrtle Fraser rightly said, and it will remove a practical buyer, a barrier for commercial transactions in order to meet modern-day expectations. The, as has been already stated, the, the codification and the, the principles around third party rights relate to uh, the ability for contract uh, for, for parties who are not directly uh, party to the contract in question uh, to have um, rights within that framework so uh, i think it's been right to allude to a few different aspects of commercial law and i'd like to refer to a few it's been stated in the evidence, particularly in the, the SPICE report, that this will have application in insurance and also in pensions. But there's been some focus today on construction law. And I think that is where the, this aspect, in, in my experience as a, as a solicitor, a trainee solicitor working on, on construction contracts, will have most use practically going forward. The ability for funders or a, or a buyer or a tenant to create a direct relationship and, and claim losses uh, with third parties. For example, in construction, subcontractors like an architect, uh, which has been a, a, 
common example used, but it could also be uh, other types of, of, of subcontractors to commercial contract, for example, uh, electricians or uh, other aspects of, of, of construction. The ability to create that within the contract itself will certainly be of use to practitioners and those who are looking to take forward construction contracts. And also, those who are uh, involved in commercial property transactions of, of previous uh, of, of, uh, con aspect, con construction projects of past. So for example, I uh, worked on a, a transaction once where there were multi aspects uh, to it and there were elements of the construction that had been based in English law and there were elements of the construction that had been based in Scots law and because of the third party rights that are available in English law, those were drafted into the substance of the contract itself, whereas the Scots law elements of, of the, the contracting uh, required collateral warranties. And I remember very well thinking one evening during that deal that I was going to be able to, to go home after finishing the, the Scottish contracts and being told, oh, no, we've actually got to do the collateral warranties now. And uh, for... For anyone working in construction, there, there are nuances about uh, construction law. There are nuances about uh, the inclusion of, of third party rights, whether uh, it's sometimes advantageous to put them in collateral warranties. For example, uh, there are questions around whether uh, when step in rights are, are advantageous. But overall, I think for construction lawyers and those involved in the construction business, this piece of legislation will assist in terms of uh, providing the legal frameworks that are necessary and through that also creating uh, an environment where construction projects can be taken forward uh, with, with less legal work required. Uh, although I, I, I appreciate the points that Murdo Fraser made about uh, sometimes uh, that's not always the case. Uh, I also think in terms of financing projects, these will be useful. So for example, uh, the, renewable energy projects where uh, financiers will now be able to create uh, third party rights within the contract rather than having to, to rely on collateral warranties. That will also be helpful for Scotland's uh, renewable energy industry, for, for example. I warmly welcome the flexibility as well, so the removal of irrevocability and the ability to set up flexible contracts at the outset and to adjust uh, contracts in response to events. These will be very useful aspects in, in terms of developing the law. I also welcome the fact that there's uh, inclusion in the bill around the concept of arbitration, having also worked in, 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 as part of my previous role as a lawyer on, on contracts that went to arbitration, I think any mechanisms that can help uh, make the, the, the ability for parties to seek arbitration uh, more expedient um, rather than having to go to litigation should be welcomed. I welcome the fact that the Minister is considering the points of uh, the committee and, that, uh, and also uh, points that have been raised by stakeholders around drafting and I think together we can all work together to make this piece of legislation as user friendly as possible and in the words of the, the Law Society of Scotland um, that it's uh, something that helps promote uh, Scots law and uh, for the benefit of all so that Scots law contracts can be used in Scotland where uh, uh, advantageous and uh, <laughs> we're advantageous and required thank you there you are I made you flustered uh, I call Monica Lennon to be followed by John Mason Miss Lennon please Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm also pleased to have the opportunity to speak in today's debate to agree the general principles of the Contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill. I'm also one of the members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and as you have heard, we have been taking extensive evidence on the Scottish Law Commission Bill in recent months. So if anyone wondered what we do on a Tuesday morning, you now have some idea. I was also... Uh, share the, the comments that our convener John Scott made uh, in opening to. There's a lot of people uh, to thank and they've been thanked already so I would just add my uh, thoughts to that. From the outset, um, I should say I'm, I'm not uh, a lawyer, I know many of you are, um, this is very technical. So from the outset I was, I was really keen to understand why this bill was actually required in the first place and, and who would benefit from it. 
Um, we've had a lot of uh, weeks to consider that and I think as we've gone forward, I've been persuaded by the bill uh, and its merits. The Minister in her opening remarks outlined that third party rights are helpful in, in everyday life uh, and in business. So it is important therefore that Scots law keeps up with society and is effective. There is consensus that the current common law arrangements do not achieve this. And there's also consensus that the bill will provide a welcome remedy. So it's good to have something that we can all agree on. At Delegated Powers Law Reform Committee, we explored in written and oral evidence what benefits would be derived from moving from the current common law position to a statutory footing. We heard that case law is unlikely to develop fast enough to deal with the problems identified in the law. Indeed, the Bill team and the Scottish Law Commission have indicated that relying on the common law position is unsustainable. The legal uncertainty arising from the current common law approach was a concern raised by many of the witnesses and the underlying rationale for bringing this bill forward has been that the current arrangements are simply not fit for purpose. A lack of certainty in the law is preventing the use of third party rights which then leads to a lack of case law preventing the law from being developed. I think John Scott has already uh, quoted uh, David Christie of the Robert Gordon University, who describes that scenario as a death spiral, and very eloquently so. The evidence overwhelmingly found that the system needs an upgrade, and so this bill seeks to codify the existing law on third party rights into one easily accessible place. That is a very welcome step. So how will this bill be used? That's an issue that I contemplated many times during your uh, deliberations. Um, if this bill is enacted, um, will it become a useful law and one that will be used in the face of, of competing in, in well-established workarounds or reliance on English law, um, like we've heard already today? One of the themes which emerged through our evidence sessions was that the purpose of the bill will be both to clarify the law in Scotland and to promote the use of Scots law, which is also stated in the policy memorandum. Scottish Law Commission officials indicated during evidence sessions and as part of their investigation that lawyers in Scotland are applying English law to Scottish contracts, although it didn't seem to be possible to, to quantify that in any way other than through anecdotal evidence. In response to questioning on this particular point, Professor Hector McQueen of the Scottish Law Commission has said, and I quote, it is certainly not that we have anything against the use of English law or indeed English law generally. It is more a case of where Scots law is not doing the job. It is up to Scottish lawyers, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish courts where possible to do something about that. If one leaves a law in a state that means nobody uses it, there is something amiss. Our attitude to such matters is just part of the mechanics of society, if you like. People will remain free to use English law if they prefer it and they might do so. However, it is a pity if the legal system is not working for those who work in it, In quote. I think that captures the principles and the practical aims that underpin the, the bill exceptionally well. At the same time, I think there's been a, a, a dose of realism about the implementation of the bill. Uh, we've heard from the experience in England and Wales that it has taken time for legislation to be adopted. It's therefore perhaps to be expected that the bill's provisions will not um, necessarily be adopted by the legal profession in Scotland immediately. In fact, we've heard that legislation on third party rights had been in place in England and Wales for some time through the 1999 Contracts Act. But there's only recently been an uptake in the use of the Act and even then, as we've heard again, um, it appears that in most cases in the construction sector, for example, um, they continue to rely on collateral warranties. But witnesses including the Law Society of Scotland and the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland have suggested that the benefits offered by the Bill could encourage legal practitioners and their clients to use new codified legislation. Of course, we're not starting from a, a standing start in Scotland. In terms of fairness and, and equal access, um, I'm going to pick up on what Dr Ross Anderson, the Faculty of Advocates, suggested, where he said that the bill may benefit people who don't have the resources to access expensive legal advice. 
And he said that one of the great advantages of the bill is that it sets out in modern language what the, the law actually is. Um, we've also heard that the use of collateral warranties can be quite uh, costly. So again, there are, there are practical benefits. Um, I didn't think I would have more to say than, than the time allows, but I, I'm, I'm being encouraged to, to wrap up there. So just in, in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I think this bill will be a useful tool for legal practitioners and their clients. No one expects it to be a, for a rapid uptake in the short term, um, but it's important Scots law um, does a, a good job. It's important for the reputation of Scots law, so uh, I welcome the principles of the bill. Can I say that this has obviously been a, a fascinating debate because we're over time. So can I ask remaining speakers to be a bit more disciplined, please, and up to six minutes. John Mason, followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I used to have the privilege uh, of being on the DPLR committee uh, in the last session of Parliament, but I did tell the Whips last May when I was re-elected that I did not want ever to be on it again. Um, However, I do accept that one attraction of this committee is its compact size of five compared to other committees which I, which I am on, uh, which are, have 11 and are totally unwieldy. Uh, can I firstly commend the committee for holding five evidence sessions? Uh, so I am reassured that they have carried out their work very diligently, as always. Uh, I think therefore Parliament can rely on them and probably needs to, many of us rely on them, in a technical area which most of us are not familiar with. I thought it was good to see the comment of James Rust of Morton Fraser that change had not taken place because, because in the past there was a lack of parliamentary time. But now that we have the Scottish Parliament, quote, the dam has burst and we have got on with it, unquote. And I think it's specifically having the DPLR to handle this type of legislation, which has clearly been good. I note the recommendation at paragraph 40 that more than one area of law reform might be considered at one time. And I certainly agree that that is worth exploring as long, again, as lay members of the committee as I was when I was on it, do not get too confused eh, by dealing with different issues at the same time. Eh, and I note the Minister is going to consider that further. Recommendations from the Scottish Law Commission which lead to SLC bills is a process which does seem to be settling down well. I was in the committee previously when we considered the last bill, which was in bankruptcy. And I have to say it's easier to speak eh, when, on these subjects when you have been on the committee. Eh, as with the, the first bill, the Legal Writings Bill, I was not on the committee but ended up speaking on it, eh, which I have to say, as others have said, that that was a bit of a challenge. As I understand it, DPLR can only consider non-contentious bills, and my feeling would be that we could relax that stipulation a bit and let them consider a slightly wider range of legislation. This is the second SLC bill dealing with contract law, eh, with Legal Writings having been the previous one, and if I remember correctly, that was to make it easier to sign contracts without all signatories having to be in the one place or the one piece of paper physically having to go around all the signers. So to focus on this particular bill, particularly, I'm particularly attracted to the SLC comment, which says they support the policy, quote, to make arbitration in Scotland and under Scots law as attractive as possible to potential users from, else, from elsewhere, as well as those already in the jurisdiction. Unquote. I think that's to be welcomed. The fact is that we do live in a competitive world and we do want to win business for our legal system, just as we do for other sectors of our culture and economy. Scots law has long been distinctive from elsewhere and it is such distinctiveness which we want to harness to our benefit. That is not to say we want to make our system as cheap as possible or otherwise encourage a race to the bottom, as the saying goes. But we do want our law to be simple and straightforward, and if that requires moving from common law to statute, so be it. I felt the SLC submission put it clearly that case law can have advantage of being more flexible, but the downside is less certainty, and that may put people off entering a contract at all, or at least entering a contract under Scots law. I like the comment by David Christie, which others have referred to, that uncertainty is effectively a death spiral, which means a lack of case law leading to the law not being developed. However, in the specific case of third party rights, it is actually the lack of flexibility in revising or amending a contract that is one of the key problems. Normally a contract can be revised or amended by agreement, but the present situation makes that more difficult if a third party is involved. We've already had reference to the House of Lords case, eh, which en enforced this inflexibility. 
The report does deal with the issue that increasing flexibility for the parties in a contract, that is removing irrevocability, can potentially reduce the rights of third parties, and that is dealt with in paragraphs 62 to 73. However, the committee reaches the conclusion that it does support abolition of the irrevocability rule, paragraph 74, and that sufficient protections have been provided. I see from its report that the DPLR committee has raised a number of issues with the minister, and she has agreed to consider these and has recently responded. I think the tone of that response seems very constructive, and I look forward to seeing what amendments might come forward at stage two. However, today we are at stage one and considering the principles of the bill. I see that the committee spent some time on the question of whether the bill will actually be used much in practice, and I think that was a worthwhile question for them to ask, as there is little point our passing legislation for the sake of it, or to appease Parliament's detractors who measure our success by the number of bills we pass. The general feeling from witnesses seems to be that this legislation will not have an immediate and dramatic impact, nor will its provisions be widely used in the short term. But it certainly moves us in the right direction, and I note the comments of Professor Wogenauer, if that's how he's pronounced, about which legal system provides, quote, the law of choice. I guess that is where many of us would want to be in the longer term, where Scotland as a small and flexible nation might provide legal and economic benefits which will attract organisations and individuals to do their business here. I'm, also, I'm always interested in any financial aspects of a bill. However, I see that there were no responses at all to the Finance Committee calling for evidence, so that is reassuring. Therefore, I am happy to add my support for the bill, and I trust members will allow it to move forward tonight. Thank you. I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Rona Mackay. Well, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, being the 10th speaker in this debate is something of a challenge, uh, even for me. <laughs> with everybody, <laughs> I won't take an intervention just yet, <laughs> with everyone agreeing and largely making the same points, of which we, we are all agreed, but, but here goes. Uh, but I just before, I mean, I, I just contrast this with the stage one debate earlier in the week on uh, seatbelts in schools. Well, that was unanimously supported. This is going to be unanimously supported. But on that debate, there were really major contentious issues. The bill could be improved, uh, and it was a really, uh, really uh, effective challenge of ideas in the chamber. Today, everybody is agreeing uh, with me. Right, presiding officer. Um, that was meant to be a joke, but it fell flat, but there we are. Uh, for a Liberal Democrat, you see, it's not usual to have everybody in the chamber agreeing with you. Um, there we are. But I noticed the... I'm glad everybody is agreeing with me. I, I noticed the, the, the Greens aren't here, but I would like to have included them in, in that remark. <laughs> Presenting officer, from the Liberal Democrat benches, can I start, as others have done, by thanking the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and parliamentary staff for their work to date on this relatively small but important bill. And I'd like to acknowledge all those who've given evidence to the committee as well, in particular the Scottish Law Commission whose deliberations and recommendations have given rise to this welcome and much needed codification of third party rights within contract. As the committee makes clear in their report and other members from across the chamber in this debate have highlighted, this is the bill that commands unanimous support among stakeholders. And just to ease the problem, I'm gonna to stick to about three minutes, Deputy Presiding Officer, because I've just removed the next two and a half pages of my speech. There we are, here, here. <laughs> Notwithstanding the benefits this bill is expected to deliver, however, all the evidence suggests that there's unlikely to be an immediate impact should it come into law. In the short term, take up and use of the new law is unlikely to be high. Over time, however, I think there's every reason to expect that the newly created certainty and flexibility should prove attractive and encourage greater use of the law in the future. On that point, it would be helpful to know whether the minister believes that there are steps that can be taken to raise awareness or perhaps even encourage take-up. Is this something that has been discussed with the Law Society, for example? And if so, can she update Parliament on the outcome of those discussions? Indeed, are there particular circumstances where the change in the law may be expected to have a more immediate impact or where the advantage of this bill are likely to be the most significantly felt? Deputy Presiding Officer, rare is the bill that reaches stage one without the need for some form of amendment being identified. I note the committee has helpfully identified a number of areas where the language used within the bill could benefit from being tightened up. Overall, however, I welcome the fact that ministers have accepted the case the committee has made about the need to tighten up the language and that work is already underway. 
I think it's very helpful and should ensure that Parliament is able to pass a bill in due course that delivers the certainty and flexibility that is so needed so that the contract law in Scotland around third party rights is fit for purpose in the future. And I failed by 12 seconds. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Rumble. <laughs> I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Gordon Lundhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Justice Committee, I care deeply about access to justice and about demystifying the legal process so that it's better understood by the layperson. That's why I'm happy to support the general principles of, of stage one report of the contract third party rights Scotland bill, which replaces the current law, which is causing uncertainty and confusion. In short, it's passed its sell by date. The changes proposed are based on the recommendations made by the Scottish Law Commission, which found that the existing law is no longer fit for purpose. This new bill provides a new statutory framework which incorporates clearer, more user-friendly rules on third-party rights. These rights, as we've heard, uh, can be of use in a wide range of both personal and commercial situations, for example, insurance contracts, company contracts, construction contracts, and last but not least, pensions, where an employer's pension scheme might allow a third party to be nominated as the beneficiary if the employee dies while still in employment. Some of the difficulties with the current law include confusion over whether third parties have a right to claim damages for breach of a third party right. Time limits for bringing claims under the current law are also very unclear. The general rule is that most claims can no longer be made five years after the day in which loss, injury or damage first occurred. However, the Prescription and Limitations Scotland Act 1973 doesn't even mention third party rights. In addition, the rule of irrevocability is too inflexible. We know that under Scots law, third party rights have to be irrevocable, but there is uncertainty as to what this actually means. And the SLC believes the need for irrevocability is one of the main problems with the current law. Scottish arbitration le le legislation under the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010 doesn't deal exp expressly with third party rights, unlike in England, Wales, and some other countries where the law enables third party disputes under certain circumstances to be dealt with by arbitration. Presiding officer, it's clear that this law needs a new statutory framework, and that's why it's been universally welcomed by stakeholders, such as the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland, who say it will clear up areas of ambiguity and doubt. The Law Society of Scotland states, the law on this issue is outdated compared to the approach of other modern legal systems. I note that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee raised concerns about the drafting of some provisions in the bill, and I'm pleased that the Scottish Government mm -hmm. will reflect on the clarity and usability of these positions, because that is, after all, the main purpose of this new statutory framework. The good news is that the bill is not expected to result in any great costs, and there is an argument uh, that it could provide, in time, some savings to businesses and to the legal profession. Presiding officer, I stated at the outset that I applaud anything which brings clarification to legal matters and which enhances access to justice. And for that reason, I'm happy to recommend the general principles of the contract's third party rights bill to the chamber today. <laughs> Uh, and I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Emma Harper. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, who can say that Scottish law is not interesting after the contributions we've had on this matter here today? Um, I must say that as a member of the Faculty of Advocates and a long-time student of the law, uh, details in my register of interest to which I make reference in passing, the concept of uptake of a new law does seem to be rather less than traditional Scots legal parlance. Use quasitum tertio rather rolls off the tongue more readily than the thought of someone going into the supermarket of law and choosing a nice juicy law like the Contracts Third Party Rights Scotland Act 2017. That may come more easily to parliamentarians like ourselves. It is, however, right to consider the background to where we find ourselves today. The case of Carmichael against Carmichael's executrix, reported in 1920 session cases, House of Lords at page 195, is seen as one touchstone of the current common law in Scotland on third party rights. It is instructive to consider that the case was decided almost 100 years ago and arose out of events that took more place more than a century since. I think it's helpful to think briefly about the individuals in that case, because to do so brings us face to face with the reality of what most 
if not all law is about, fellow human beings like ourselves. No doubt Mr. Hugh Fletcher Carmichael did not think he would be making legal history when he accepted that proposal for insurance on 21st October 1903, nor is it likely that he wished to ever see the policy which was taken out on the life of his son Ian Carmichael and cashed on his son's death. He paid the annual premium of nine pounds, 10 shillings, but no pence in, to use the words of the policy, lawful money of Great Britain for many years. His son Ian joined the new and fledgling Air Force during the First World War and tragically died in an air accident in the summer of 1916. Ian had left a will in favor of his aunt, Miss McCall, as his executrix. His father, however, had kept and retained the policy in his possession. And sadly, there followed a dispute between Mr. Carmichael and Miss McCall about who was entitled to have the proceeds paid out to them. And out of that dispute arose the case of Carmichael against Carmichael's executrix, eventually decided in the House of Lords in favor of Miss McCall. I've outlined that background of the case and the individuals involved simply to bring to life the bill that we are debating today. Amongst the dusty legal furniture of bills, sections, and subsections, we need to remember that what we are actually dealing with is, and will be, important in the lives of the people of Scotland. And that is one of the reasons that it is important to have legal clarity, which is one of the driving purposes behind this bill. Now with that in mind, and mindful that others have already made reference to the background, I would like to raise a number of points on drafting clarity in the bill. Uh, most of these have already been presaged in the evidence before the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and set out in its report. And I also note the letter from the Minister to my colleague John Scott as convener of the DPLR Committee setting out the Scottish Government's position on those matters and thank her for that. Uh, but notwithstanding that response, I would mention the following and hope that further thought might be given to these. Uh, three matters. First of all, the suggestion that sections one and two could conveniently be made into a single section, which was made in evidence to the committee. I think that is not a bad idea, but I have a particular concern with subsection 2.1. It states that it makes provision elaborating on section one. Now, it is unclear to me why it is thought to be at all necessary, since the normal statutory practice is to simply, as indeed is done elsewhere in section two, refer to the particular subsection it is intended to modify. If one couples subsection 2.1 with subsection 2.7 of the bill, I can see people's eyes glazing over going into the detail of this, um, the application of the normal rules of statutory interpretation may lead to undesired results. At best, in my view, subsection 2.1 appears unnecessary and superfluous, but at worst and indeed likely, it is a source of difficulty which may result in litigation. Secondly, sections 5 and 6 appear to depart from the normal mode of statutory drafting by putting a definitional subsection first, followed by the subsection it is meant to define and clarify. Contrast that with the immediately preceding section 4, which follows the usual order, i.e. a subsection which sets out a proposition and then a further definitional subsection. To a lawyer's eye, or at least mine, that looks like writing backwards. And although it may not alter the effect of the section, it does make its reading awkward for the practitioner. Thirdly and finally, and here I commend the drafting of the bill rather than criticizing it, is subsection one of section 10. Uh, now, my comment on this is not meant as a criticism of the minister, because my understanding is that she has listened to and sought to take on board comment that section 10.1 is unneeded. Uh, however, my own comment is that in a bill meant to define and bring clarity to third party rights and place them on a statutory footing, it is in fact probably helpful to have the definition contained in section 10.1 in the bill. So I simply raise that as another point. These are for what it is worth my humble comments on the bill at this stage. I call the last of the open speakers, and that's Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. 
I am pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate and I would like to take the opportunity to thank the five committee members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, John Scott, Stuart McMillan, Alison Harris, Monica Lennon and David Torrance for their work in this committee. And as is customary as well as warranted, thank the committee clerks involved in drawing together the report as well as everyone who gave evidence in the committee. I was given advice when I came here regarding um, participating in this parliament, that I should participate in debates on subjects that I am not familiar with. So I think George Adam, MSP from Paisley's advice was good. And I know he's, oh yes, back in the chamber, good. So as already, by listening to everybody and the minister, opening speeches and member speeches, I'm already better prepared to explain some, as some aspects of third party laws and I look forward to supporting South of Scotland constituents if this arises. <laughs> and since you know, I've attended many committee meetings, cross party groups and many events, although my background is in healthcare, since being elected I have had to engage in many different subject areas and learn to adopt a new language in order to assess and process information that is presented to me. I have adopted words like Scottish statutory instruments, affirmative and negative and process of annulment and now thanks to DPLR collateral warranties. But learning about the various processes involved in running our country and developing knowledge in a range of areas and portfolios is something I enjoy about this job as an MSP. Yesterday, I stumbled upon a conversation in the corridor with colleagues about today's debate. Although I am no expert on the law, I was interested to hear about the importance of this contract third party rights Scotland bill in bringing an area of Scots law into line with what happens internationally. Some examples have been mentioned already. My goal today is to speak about this report and convey to South Scotland constituents how the bill will positively affect them. So I first looked for a definition of third party and it's simple generic terms, any individual who does not have a direct connection with a legal transaction but who might be affected by it. The Scottish Law Commission examined Scots law on third party rights in 2014 and compared it with international benchmarks. Last year, the Scottish Law Commission's report was published and concluded that the existing law needed to be replaced. These concerns were about the lack of clarity and inflexibility in the current law. The Law Society of Scotland highlighted this uncertainty and noted that lawyers do not like to give advice in areas where the law is unclear. Scots law on third party rights dates from the House of Lords decision in 1920. And that is the case that Donald Cameron mentioned so eloquently, the case of Car Carmichael versus Carmichael's executrix. And if I had to repeat what Donald had to do, um, I probably would have had to stop at one minute. The judge decided that it was not enough for contracting parties to intend a third party to have a right by saying so in their contract. They must take additional formal steps to make this provision irrevocable. In order to be established under current law, the contract must identify the third party, show an intention of contracting parties to confer a benefit and provide a benefit which is unalterable and irrevocable. The current situation in Scotland is unfortunate as contracts in favour of third parties are of great economic importance, particularly with regard to life insurance and contracts of annuity. I understand that a further issue concerns the inability of groups of companies to rely on third party rights to deal with group loss. This problem arises where a company operates using a complex group structure and suffers loss due to problems caused by a supplier's failure to provide a particular service. The supplier can, in the absence of a clearly defined third party right, state by way of defence that they were only contracting with one member of the group. As a result of these complexities, the Scottish Law Commission found that legal practitioners and their clients are relying on English instead of Scots law, and that's been mentioned in relation to third party rights. In evidence sessions, the committee was told that there has been an awareness of the problems created by the 1920 judgment since the, um, the post-Second World War period. However, Professor Beale of the University of Warwick told the committee that there had been an equally long period between the identification of the problem and its resolution in England and Wales. 
The bill in question was supported universally during the committee's evidence sessions. It will implement the Scottish Law Commission's recommendations and reform the common law and third parties' rights. I spoke earlier about thanking the witnesses for the evidence that they provided, um, and I am aware that Minister Annabel Ewing was extremely knowledgeable about the complexities of third party law when giving evidence directly to the committee. And that is welcome news that our Minister is well informed in her portfolio. Presiding officer, the bill has been welcomed by stakeholders, including the Law Society of Scotland and the Royal Incorporation of Architects. Third parties will benefit the bill because it will become clearer how a third party may enforce his or her right. For example, as has been mentioned, if a mother books a holiday for her spouse and her children and the holiday fails to deliver on promises made in the contract, the mother can claim damages for her disappointment, but so can her spouse and each child as third parties with rights under this contract. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call on Mary Fee. Uh, around six minutes, please, Ms Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In closing for Scottish Labour, I'd like to thank everyone for taking part in today's debate. And it's clear from the debate today that we are all in agreement that the Contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill is a necessary change required to our legal system to benefit all parties entering contracts. And can I also thank the Scottish Law Commission for undertaking this work and the resulting bill and thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for producing a very informative Stage 1 report. And to ensure our legal system is fair, balanced and just, Scottish Labour support the changes proposed by Scottish Law Commission. Commission. And by replacing the common law third party rights with a statutory version, we can end the uncertainty and inflexibility around the current system. The committee report informs us that the bill is universally supported and welcomed by all stakeholders. And, presiding officer, the speed of law reform is an issue that isn't new to politicians or those in the legal profession. And the proposed changes to third party rights in Scotland are not unique in the lack of progression to reform the law. Nearly a century after the House of Lords judgment in Carmichael v Carmichael's executrix, it is right we make the necessary changes soon. And I was surprised to read the evidence from Professor Beale of the University of Warwick, who highlighted that in England and Wales, the work to change third party rights started in 1937 and legislation was only produced in 1999. On the general principles of the bill, creating legal certainty and flexibility are important and crucial benefits of changing the replacing common law with a statutory approach. The committee reports that the current common law position is unsustainable, as case law is unlikely to develop fast enough to deal with the problems identified. Indeed, that view was shared by those who provided evidence. And on creating legal certainty, we read David Christie described the current system as a death spiral. And these are strong words, and lawyers are by nature risk-averse creatures. And of course, they have to be for obvious reasons. And businesses, investors, and public bodies also fear uncertainty. And you only have to look at the constitutional quagmire that grips the UK to know that. And as a result of uncertainty, we read that lawyers are resorting to other jurisdictions for certainty. David Christie of Robert Gordon University rightly referred to the bill as rebooting common law. And turning to the speakers in the debate today, speakers have illustrated the benefits that this bill will bring in areas such as insurance and, and finance. And the minister in her opening remarks spoke of the need for legislation that is fit for purpose, also mentioned by Ben McPherson in his contribution. Monica Lennon spoke of the savings this bill may bring as highlighted in evidence by the Law Commission and the Royal Corporation of Architects. Claire Baker spoke of the need for clarity and the uncertainty that currently exists, whilst also highlighting the need for third parties to be protected. And John Mason touched on the need to make arbitration more attractive. And presiding officer, as one of the closing speakers in, in today's debate, can I just say that I wholeheartedly support Murdo Fraser's opening remarks. And turning back to the legislation, the flexibility this legislation will bring is a key benefit and an issue that has been raised by several speakers, including Stuart McMillan and Alison Harris. 
and the abolition of the irrevocability rule is welcome in order to make it easier to create and remove third party rights in contracts. The committee report and the bill's explanatory notes give some details of the issues surrounding flexibility using the current common law approach. And the Law Society of Scotland and the Faculty of Advocates support the abolition. And in supporting the abolition and welcoming increased flexibility, Kenneth Rose, partner of CMS Cameron McKenna, LLP, talks of the required flexibility, making our legal system more attractive and user-friendly for individual parties. And it is right that we abolish the irrevocability rule to ensure the protections and balances required for third parties entering contracts. And, presiding officer, I recently criticised the Scottish Government during the Railway Policing Bill for trying to fix something that wasn't broken. Here is an area of law that is broken and must be fixed. And this legislation might not be as important an issue to the public as policing, but it is very necessary for our businesses, our investors, our public bodies and any other users of Scots law to ensure legal certainty in contracts. And we on, these we on these benches are happy to support the principles of the Contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill. Thank you. I now call Adam Tompkins, and strangely enough, we now um, have time in hand. So a generous seven minutes, not too generous, Mr Tompkins, <laughs> <laughs> a generous seven minutes. Um, th thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. When Murdo Fraser and I um, contracted with our whip uh, not to have to speak in James Dornan's earlier members' debate on the Lisbon Lions, we had um, little idea that we would have to sign a collateral warranty to appear in this debate instead. But as Rangers fans, that is supporters of Scotland's most successful club, it was, of course, nice to listen earlier today to memories of Celtic's historic achievements. Um, uh, Presiding Officer, my law school colleagues, past and present, would be both, I think, appalled and alarmed to know that I was speaking in a debate about the law of contract. Not only was the law of contract my worst paper um, at university, but of course I had the misfortune to study the English law of contract and not Scots law. Um, uh, the Minister, Annabel Ewing, referred um, to there being uh, eminent jurists uh, in the chamber this afternoon um, uh, I don't know who she was referring to. I'm sure she wasn't referring to me, but I'm certainly not an eminent jurist in the, in the law of contract. Constitutional law is my field. And there are some overlaps between um, uh, contract law and uh, constitutional law. And I was reminded uh, of the uh, great work by Sir Henry Maine, um, The Ancient Law. Uh, and the principal argument in this um, great work was that over the centuries, law had moved from status to contract law had moved from a hierarchical order to a voluntary uh, compact. Stanley Baldwin, the great interwar conservative prime minister, said that Henry Maine had been his most influential tutor, um, although he confessed that he couldn't quite remember whether Maine's argument had been that law had moved from status to contract or whether it had been the other way around, um, which just goes to show, I suppose, that you can be a successful political leader without paying any attention uh, in your uh, law lectures. Um, contracts, presiding officer, um, allow people uh, and indeed uh, companies uh, to create rights and duties which can be enforced in court. And in general, these rights and duties uh, are only enforceable, as we've heard, between parties to the contract, and no right or obligation can be created in respect of someone who is a stranger uh, to the contract and who is termed a third party. In some legal systems, the rule is strictly uh, enforced. Uh, in Scots law, by contrast, it's long been recognised that in certain limited circumstances, a contract can contain enforceable rights in favour of a third party. And we've heard uh, from numerous contributions, including from the Minister uh, this afternoon, how these third party rights can be used in a wide range of personal and commercial situations, including in insurance contracts, in contracts involving company groups, in construction contracts that Ben McPherson and others have talked about, and also, I think, in uh, pensions law. The current common law uh, is widely uh, criticised in Scotland, not least because of this rule of irrevocability, um, uh, which um, uh, insists uh, that 
uh, the third party right to be enforceable uh, needs to be clear to the third party uh, from uh, such circumstances as delivery or intimation or equivalent, and that the parties intended, the parties to the contract that is, intended to give up the right to change their minds about granting the third party right. Um, Brodie's, one of Scotland's leading law firms, described in evidence uh, to the Delegated Powers Committee that the Scots law in this area is stuck in the 17th century, which is an odd thing to say about an area of law that dates really from a case decided in 1920. Uh, but it is, I think, uh, widely regarded uh, as being historic and inflexible, as being not fit for purpose. And the irrevocability rule is, as I've just said, particularly uh, controversial. And as we've heard, representatives of both the Law Society of Scotland and the Faculty of Advocates have welcomed this bill and its uh, proposed removal of the irrevocability uh, rule. Um, uh, the, um, it, is, uh, it has been difficult, um, uh, presiding officer, to find very much uh, politics uh, in this uh, bill, and that's probably um, a good thing. But let me just make one uh, point about it, which may uh, or may not be something that the minister would want to respond to in her uh, winding up. It, it is very important that Scots law retains its market competitiveness. There is, a, there is a, a market, uh, there is a competition in, in, in legal systems. And we've heard numerous um, speakers this afternoon talk of how uh, Scots lawyers uh, are drafting contracts at the moment which are enforceable under English law, that's to say in the English courts, rather than in Scots law because of the uh, antiquated nature of our rules with regard to third party contracts. Um, and we've also heard how um, this is an area of law which has changed in England as long ago as 1999 uh, and we're now only uh, and we're only now changing it here in Scotland. Now, I know that we're doing it now because the uh, Scottish Law Commission has only relatively recently reported on it. My point, my question to the Minister would be this. Um, if there are other areas of Scots law uh, but where we are losing our market edge, where we are losing our competitiveness because the statute book has not been kept up to date and the common law uh, is falling uh, behind, uh, is it part of the government's thinking to encourage the Law Society uh, sorry, to encourage the Scottish Law Commission to identify these areas at an early uh, opportunity and to report on them so that we can update uh, Scots law so that it is able to compete uh, effectively uh, with other legal systems in Europe and other legal systems indeed uh, um, in the uh, United uh, Kingdom. It does seem uh, odd um, uh, that we are um, dealing with a problem only now which was created by a House of Lords judgment nearly a century um, ago. Law doesn't always move uh, very quickly, but this does seem particularly slow. As Stuart McMillan and others said in their um, interventions in uh, the debate this afternoon, this bill is an exercise in the codification uh, of an aspect of Scots contract law. And this puts me in mind um, uh, the very first essay I wrote as a very young law student um, uh, um, a number of years ago. Um, and the subject that I was studying in the first year of my law degree was comparative legal systems. And the essay that my tutor uh, asked me uh, to write was a, an essay comparing the strengths and the limitations of codification as a means of um, law reform. Um, uh, and uh, the essay, no copy remains, uh, I'm glad to say. So, uh, no, I'm very glad to say that no copy of this uh, rather tire tiresome essay uh, remains. But I remember that I took the French Civil Code as an example of what not to do when you're codifying um, uh, when you're using codification as a means of, of legal uh, reform. And uh, so the first half of the essay was you know, a ser series of arguments against codification. And then I second, started the second half of the essay with the phrase, however, to be fair to the French, and then wrote about why you should codify. And my tutor um, took exception to this opening line of part two of this essay, and he underlined it. And, uh, um, and he said in the margin, arrest this unhealthy tendency. Um, never be fair to the French. That's the only bit of advice from that particular law tutor that I uh, can uh, remember. Uh, in closing, presiding officer, two quick comments about specific aspects of the bill which have been referred to by the uh, um, uh, Delegate Powers and Law Reform Committee, which the Minister has responded to in uh, her letter, which I saw only for the first time uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, um, and, and which I would just urge her to uh, pause and think about, uh, again, given the strength of the um, concerns that are reported uh, by the Delegated Powers 
committee. The first is the use of the word undertaking uh, in section one, which does seem from the evidence that the committee has uh, marshaled to be uh, something which is uh, ripe for what would be wholly unnecessary uh, litigation. And it might just be worth having another look to ensure that that word is used appropriately and is defined as carefully and as specifically as, possibly, as possible. And secondly, uh, with regard to the committee's comments on sections four to six, uh, of the bill, um, which have already been uh, mentioned by other uh, members this afternoon. Um, the Faculty of Advocates was quite strong in its evidence that these provisions were not drafted appropriately. The Law Society of Scotland shared those views. Uh, Craig Connell said that he could see litigation written all over uh, these provisions. Uh, and uh, Professor Hugh Beale, who wrote the Law of Contract book that I studied from many years ago at university, said um, that uh, these provisions were hard to understand, well, so was his book. Um, so I would urge the Minister respectfully and gently to reconsider um, whether uh, the bill uh, has been appropriately drafted in, in, in the, these provisions. I know that she said in her letter today that she's on balance satisfied that the bill is satisfactorily drafted, but I think that those issues might um, merit further consideration. Thank you very much. I have taken advice, Mr Tomkins, and we reckon that was a B plus. <laughs> <laughs> Call on the Minister to close this debate. Can you take us up to about 25 past, please? Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I would like to begin by uh, thanking the members here today for their contributions to what has been, I think, a, a worthwhile debate. Uh, and I would say there are important contributions from uh, across the chamber, uh, be they from lawyers, eminent or otherwise, or from non-lawyers uh, alike. And I, I thank them for uh, their consideration of the uh, important issues that we have been looking at today. Uh, I am pleased that members share the aims of reforming the law in this area and that there is support for the general principles of the bill uh, across the chamber. A clear, positive and readily accessible statement of the law in a short statute will improve the standing and value of Scots law. It is clear that contracting parties to a contract and those who are provided with third party rights in a contract should all benefit from the law being clearer, up to date and more flexible. Where a third party has rights under a contract as a result of this legislation, they will be able to take full advantage of the legal remedies for any breach of contract that would be available to a party uh, to that contract where they undertake in favour of that party and also the defences on the part of the contracting parties uh, uh, will be available in terms of any claims from the third party to the extent they're relevant. And I think that is an important issue that perhaps wasn't uh, touched on so much uh, this afternoon. I have listened with interest to what has been said and of course I will reflect and consider all points uh, that have been made and also perhaps on the more technical uh, issues raised by uh, Gordon Lindhurst and at the end uh, in terms at least of the section one definition of undertaking uh, by Adam uh, Tompkins. Um, there were other uh, points raised today which I would like to seek to try to respond in the time available at least to some of them. Now, in terms of the, the general issue of the pace of law reform, we have heard reference, I think, from, from Murdo Fraser and from Mary Fee to the uh, example of the English uh, and Welsh legislation, which uh, uh, dated from 1999, but in fact we see from the committee's uh, deliberations that discussions on that legislation first started in 1937, I believe, but I think it's important to recall that the legislation in England and Wales introduced third party rights into the law for the first time because, of course, they had uh, proceeded on the basis of privacy of contract and therefore it's not quite the same to make a direct comparison to what has been going on in Scotland where third party rights have been in existence for centuries and I think the earliest case on record uh, and uh, I don't know if Mr Tompkins B plus would have perhaps been higher if he'd been able to make reference to this one uh, was in fact the Moncur case which dates from the 15. 90s, uh, wherein we see a, a reference to third party rights. So Scotland has had the, uh, the common law of third party rights for centuries. What we have seen are particular problems developing with regard to certainty and flexibility, indeed around about 100 years ago, with the seminal case of Carmichael v Carmichael's executrix that many members have been referring to today and obviously uh, are becoming quite um, uh, relaxed about citing uh, legal, uh, seminal legal cases, which I think is a very positive uh, uh, development. Uh, and we did hear a very eloquent overview of the facts of, of the Carmichael v Carmichael's executrix uh, case from 
uh, Gordon uh, Lindhurst. So those problems were, were uh, uh, starting to develop as a feature of that case. However, uh, it is not fair to say that that then has been an ongoing focus of activity since that case came into force because, of course, it's only recently as society, commerce and industry have developed that they, these problems have been more acutely uh, felt. Uh, so I think that is important to, to place that in, in some context. Uh, but, of course, um, the position is that we recognise that the 1920 case did cause a lot of problems and that is why we are engaged in this important piece of work to see what we can do to bring our uh, law up to the 21st century and to fix the problems that have clearly uh, uh, been uh, identified. And that is what this bill is designed uh, to do. I would say more widely in the area of law reform, it is important not perhaps to react to particular decisions and developments overnight because, of course, a one-off rogue decision of a court can often be quickly overturned. Uh, and in many instances, the law is capable of keeping itself in good order. This has not proven to be the case, however, with regard to the enforcement of third-party rights in Scots law. Of course, at the same time, it's important to, to note that uh, the law is often complex. It needs careful thought and consideration. Uh, and I would agree with uh, what Stuart McMillan said that the DPLRC plays a very important uh, role in this parliament in terms of progressing uh, law reform. I think in that regard, Adam Tompkins uh, suggested that we may seek to accelerate uh, this process. And indeed, uh, we have regular meetings with the uh, Scottish Law Commission and I am due to meet with Lord Pentland, I think, uh, in September. And that is, of course, an issue we can uh, discuss going forward. Uh, what I would say at the same time, of course, is that um, reforms to the uh, civil law of Scotland had, prior to the reconvening of this parliament, been a matter for the Westminster parliament. And, of course, in a crowded uh, uh, agenda, uh, it was perhaps not uh, the, uh, the, uh, the focus, perhaps, was not on reforming uh, Scots' uh, uh, civil uh, law. Um, also, in terms of the issue that Stuart McMillan raised, uh, about whether or not we could look at in our approach to law reform uh, via the DPLRC uh, as to whether or not it would be possible for the Scottish Law Commission to consider, perhaps to use an ungainly word, bundling up certain what would otherwise be discrete issues. And that is something I'm also happy to take up uh, with uh, Lord Pentland when I next and meet him to see to what extent that would be possible because, of course, all of us would be interested in ensuring that we keep our law up uh, to date. Um, in terms of the issue of uh, how quickly we feel this legislation, if passed by this parliament, will be uh, taken up, uh, of course, we, we cannot be definitive, but uh, again, I would stress that our starting point here is different from that in England and Wales, where, of course, that legislation in 1999 introduced in England and Wales uh, third party uh, rights for the first time. Uh, I, I understand though that of course uh, from a commercial perspective it is uh, clear to uh, uh, the members of the legal profession and indeed to those conducting business in Scotland that this would be a route to save time and money uh, and legal fees which is always an attractive option on the part particularly of, of business and therefore it may be that we will see over time that the recourse to the workarounds that we have referred to this afternoon, including uh, collateral warranties, will become uh, less uh, attractive. In terms of the issue raised by Mike Rumbles and others of how we encourage uh, use of the new legislation, um, what I would say is uh, that reform of this kind often, uh, in fact, has a momentum uh, of its own. Uh, and I know that uh, Professor Hector McQueen of the Scottish Law Commission, who is listening to our deliberations uh, this afternoon has uh, spoken at many law conferences and has uh, in, uh, spoken about this legislation and hopefully has encouraged others to consider making recourse to this legislation when hopefully passed by this parliament. Also members of the, uh, the, the, the law society and members of the faculty have also spoken about the role that they can play in, in raising the profile of this legislation. Uh, we have heard from David Wedderburn of the Royal Incorporation of Architects when he presented evidence to, to the effect that he would be issuing practice notes to members alerting them to when the bill uh, becomes uh, an act. Uh, and we also, of course, will work, as I said in my evidence at stage one in committee, uh, we will work with business and with the legal profession to see what we can do to facilitate uh, uh, take up an awareness of this legislation. 
And of course, I, I will be happy to raise that matter with the Law Society uh, when I have my regular discussions with the Law Society. Turning to the uh, issue of sections 426, I have heard members' comments about those sections uh, this afternoon, and of course I will reflect on them further, because what I would say is the government is absolutely committed to the principle that legislation should be clear uh, and accessible, but I would also say that it needs to be uh, effective. And I would stress that no one who has offered evidence has suggested that sections 4 to 6 do not produce the right result. All that is being said is that the sections could perhaps be, be drafted uh, differently. And whilst it is, of course, always possible to draft provisions differently, it has also to be recalled that there's no immediate consensus amongst witnesses on what might be a better formulation. But I will, as I say, agree to reflect further. But I remain not entirely persuaded that such changes would be necessary to ensure that the bill is as effective as it can be. Um, on the issue of dispute re res resolution mechanisms on the face of the bill, uh, in terms of, for example, adjudication, I would just point to the evidence of Hugh Dundas, Das, Honorary Vice President at the Scottish Arbitration Centre, who concluded by saying uh, that, in summary, adding adjudication is not necessary and could be uh, confusing. So I think uh, we are minded to uh, reflect the position of such an eminent witness, and indeed, I think that was the conclusion that the committee uh, itself uh, reached. I think I am moving towards my uh, conclusion, presiding officer, and what I would say uh, is that this has been a comprehensive debate on an important piece of legislation, and I do thank all members for their contributions and for their uh, impressive diligence in consideration of the very technical issues raised by the bill. It is much appreciated and it has made for a much more interesting debate than I think some of us had initially uh, uh, foreseen. Uh, I have indicated that I am intending to bring forward amendments to section 10 and section 12. I have also indicated that I am still reflecting on the points raised about section 9 and arbitration uh, and whilst I do believe that they may have arisen as a result of a misunderstanding, we will continue discussions with the SLC, SLC and with the the Faculty of Advocates. Uh, conclusion, presiding officer, I will, of course, on the other general points raised that I've not had time to refer to specifically in my winding up comments, look carefully at all the contributions that have been made. And I do look forward to progressing the bill through the next stages in the Parliament. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes stage one on the Contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 5776 on the Committee of the Regions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 5767 on approval of an SSI. I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move this motion. Formally moved. And I would ask any member who wishes to speak against this motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Margaret Mitchell. Officer. Um, this instrument exempts eight health regulatory bodies as well as the General Teaching Council of Scotland and the Scottish Social Services Council from the provisions of the Apologies Scotland Act 2016. Section 3 of this Act defines an apology and the Act itself merely clarifies the law, the current law of evidence and civil proceedings relating to apologies. Quite simply, it has been long recognised by the judiciary that an apology is not good evidence for providing liability or wrongdoing. By way of background, the origin of the Act came from the cross-party group on adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse and a suggestion from the then chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission that apology legislation was an effective way to help survivors gain closure. The committee is now in receipt of a letter, that's the Justice Committee, from the current chair of the SHRC expression concerns about, one, the inclusion of the two non-health related bodies in this instrument and the lack of consultation with survivors and survivor groups. It goes on to state, therefore, that the Historic Child Abuse Action Plan Review Group should have been consulted on the provisions of this SSI.
Whilst the SHRC recognises that the eight professional health regulatory bodies are only exempted in the SSSI in response to the Scottish Government's health legislation on duty of candour, significantly it agrees with the Law Society's assessment that an apology in general is not a reliable indicator of wrongdoing and particularly as defined in Section 3 of the Act. Furthermore, it questions the necessity for regulatory bodies to be able to consider apologies. The SHRC therefore offers the following solution. One, that the GTCS and SSSC consider ways in which their process could be adjusted to allow them to work within the Apologies Scotland Act 2016 without this exemption. And second, that the impact of the GTC uh, CS and SSSC processes should be monitored to assess whether or not providing an exemption has a detrimental impact on their ability to carry out their role. The SHRC confirms it is not clear that this will be the case given the position of the other regulatory bodies. Presiding officer, I would request that the Minister withdraw the SSI with a view to implementing the two suggestions proposed by the SHRC. A failure to do so raises serious questions about the effect of scrutiny of primary and secondary legislation in this Parliament. Thank you very much. I call on Annabel Ewing as Minister to respond. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. These regulations do two things in relation to the Apologies Scotland Act. They make a small amendment to the existing exception for inquiries and they add an exception for the proceedings of 10 professional regulators. These are the regulator of social service workforce and the regulator of teachers in Scotland, as well as eight health professionals regulators. As I explained in the Justice Committee evidence session, it is clear that the Apologies Act could have negative unintended consequences for these regulators' fitness to practice proceedings. In particular, it would impact on their ability to establish facts and make risk assessments and ultimately on their ability to protect the public. This exception is about professional regulation and it does not in any way prevent institutions such as schools or local authorities offering apologies. And this key point is indeed recognised by the Scottish Human Rights Commission in their letter to the committee, referred to already this afternoon, and to, which I, I, who, to whom I will be writing to, to set out these points in detail. The need for this exception was raised by the General Medical Council and the Nursing and Midwifery Council as early as during stage one of the Apologies Scotland Bill, and their concerns were recognised by the Justice Committee in their stage one report. Continued work revealed that these concerns extended beyond the health regulators. The Scottish Social Services Council and the General Teaching Council for Scotland have made clear they share the concerns about the impact of the Act on their proceedings. This exception is about the need to protect the coherence of the regulatory processes in order that the organisations can fulfil their mission. These regulators are concerned that if their professional regulatory proceedings were not accepted, it would impinge on their ability to police their profession and ensure that the public are protected. The proceedings are there to ensure that we all have confidence in these professions. The point is that in these fitness to practice proceedings, an apology can say something important about the suitability of that person practicing a profession. We know that there are other professions where an apology is less important and apologies do not feature among the evidence considered. As I undertook in the Justice Committee evidence session, my officials have written to other regulators whose proceedings are not included in this exception to explore how they are taking account of the Apology Scotland Act 2016. I have also written to the group of survivors of childhood abuse who raised concerns with the committee about these regulations. I have explained to them that accepting these regulators' fitness to practice proceedings from the scope of the Apologies Act, uh, Scotland Act 2016, will in no way cut across the ability of institutions such as schools or local authorities to make apologies to survivors of childhood abuse. I am pleased that in their response, this group of survivors say they found the letter very helpful in explaining this matter and the reasoning behind the Scottish Government approach. I am grateful to the Justice Committee for their thorough scrutiny of these regulations and for the cross-party agreement to recommend to the Parliament that they be approved. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. We now move to decision time and there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 5762 in the name of Annabel Ewing on stage one of the contract third party rights Scotland bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
The next question is that motion 5776 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on Committee of the Regions be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 5767 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed and we'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 5767 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 50, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting of Parliament.